Hi, my name is Yuval Lichschitz. I work for Red Hat and I work on the Ceph project, mainly on the uh, Red Hat Gateway, which is the object front end for Ceph. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about ransomware. One big disclaimer here is that I'm not a security person uh, or an expert. I'm a storage person. Uh, then some information theory background, just to understand what are the concepts that we're talking about regarding entropy. Um, then about the Ceph storage system with focus on object store, um, how the Rook operator makes everything easy to deploy in the OpenShift or Kubernetes environment. Uh, focus a little more on the uh, Lua scripting ability inside the object store, and then tie everything together and explain how our solution works. So ransomware, well, it's here to stay. It's a most powerful tool for um, the bad guys and they're not going to give up on that. It gives them control uh, over information, which is the main thing that on the main asset of many organizations and allows them to use it to the leverage to get what, whether they want money or other things from, uh, from those organizations. Another, cons uh, another uh, thing we have to take into account here is that the first line of defense will always break, which means that no matter how many um, training you're going to give to the people not to, to open um, suspicious emails and so on, um, something's going to get in. They're going to put the malware in your system and eventually via social engineering or zero day attacks, uh, the system is going to be inf infected. And then detecting ransomware while it's incubating is hard. It is hard because this is the most critical time in which if you detected ransomware, you can still save lots of your data. And because of that, whoever is developing the ransomware is going to do everything that they can to hide their software or their, whatever they're doing during this period. So as a result, there are uh, known approaches that say that the way to detect uh, ransomware during this period of while well, it's incubating, so after your system was infected, but before you get that big sign saying, hey, pay us the money, otherwise we're not going to see uh, your data anymore, um, then um, people have developed um, approaches to detect ransomware, not directly because the soft's going to hide itself, but indirectly by showing behavioral changes or animalities in other systems. So storage is a good, good option because ransomware encrypts your files. Um, so uh, we can use the storage systems in order to detect the, uh, uh, the behavior that is different from the regular behavior. We have to use something, uh, some behavioral uh, characteristic of the ransomware that it uses for its own benefit, because otherwise it's not going to use that. Um, and um, it has to be something that is different than the regular behavior that we see in our system. Otherwise, we won't be able to differentiate between the two. And the last thing is that, ideally, uh, we detect that not on the inf infected system, but on other systems. So for example, um, if those, the desktops of, of the enterprise are the ones that infected, then ideally you can detect the, um, the behavior change in the, uh, the storage servers or in some other system. The reason for that is that those systems are usually more secure. Uh, they have a small attack surface. And we can assume that those systems were not infected and the ransomware cannot control them. Um, and, and therefore, it will be uh, easy for us to detect that, assuming that the animalities are manifested somehow in those systems. So what are we going to use for this detection? We're going to use a concept from information theory called an entropy. So entropy is the amount of randomness or um, information that has in a we have in a random variable so information is divide is defined as the um as the log in the base of two of the probability of an event and given this definition then the entropy is the sum or the weighted sum based on the probabilities of those information for all the events of uh, a random variable now when we talk about the uh information uh the reason we use the base of two is because we talk about bit entropy, because the events are either zeros and ones, 
and this is why we use the, the uh, base of two. And this is when when we measure the the units of measurements for for entropy or for information are uh, bits of information. So this is the definition of entropy. Uh, this is a bit high level and, and kind of mathematic, and so we would like to have a look at a, a more concrete example. So um, let's look at an example where the random variable is actually a, a sentence. And it's a sentence made of an alphabet of 26 letters and a space. Um, and uh, in this case, we have to talk about normalized entropy because our alphabet now is not zeros and ones, but one of those 27 characters. And therefore, we do this uh, extra math of just dividing. Uh, so it's just pretty much the same definition, only uh, normalized or divided by the size of the alphabet. Let's have a look at such a random variable, which is a sentence, sentence hello world. So uh, first of all, we need to create the distribution of this random variable. So we have a list here of all the uh, English letters and the space, and we give the probability of each one of them to appear in the sentence hello world. So we see most of them are not in the sentence, and um, there are a couple that are, and uh, let's say some of them appear a little more than the others, like the letter L. And if we do the math according to our definition and calculate the entropy of this sentence hello world, we got a number of uh, 0.598. Now let's take a different sentence. The other sentence we're going to take is the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog. As you probably know, what characterizes the sentence is that it has at least one of each of the English letters in it. Well, not exactly one. Some of the letters appear more than once and the space appear more than once. But it covers all the letters. And when you look at the distribution of this random variable, this sentence, uh, then you would see that, well, it is more, it's more like a uniform distribution, much more than the first example, uh, because it has all the letters appears in some probability. Um, and it's pretty much the same probability for all the letters, except one that's a little more. And when we do we calculate the normalized entropy for this sentence or for this random variable we see a much higher value so um this some this kind of give us a hint of something that entropy can represent and this is how close is the distribution uh to a uniform distribution where the probability for each event is identical now let's have, look at an entropy of a file so now our random variable is actually a file. And a file contains bytes. Now it's not sampled from 26 or 27 letters. It's sampled from a number between 0 and 255 uh, because uh, this could be a binary. It doesn't have to be um, um, an ASCII file. And so we have a 256 word, word alphabet. And um, it's going to have the similar uh, characteristic that we've seen before is that the, the closest to the uh, uniform distribution that the distribution of this file is going to be, then the higher the entropy is going to be. Now, there are two types of files that are interesting here. One is compressed files, and this is very common. So JPEGs, MPEG, MP3, ZIPs, PDF, uh, uh, Word documents, or all other Office documents, they're all compressed files, and they will have higher entropy. Um, encrypted files, and those are the files that might indicate that we have um, a problem with um, um, with uh, ransomware, going to ha also have a higher entropy. And the reason is that good encryption is as close to um, uniform distribution as it can possibly be, because the whole idea is that we we don't want the, f the encrypted files to give us any information about the original content. So we want to make it as close as to uniform as, as possible. Now, this is really poses the, uh, the challenge to say, OK, uh, so is a file encrypted or is the file compressed? And uh, it's difficult to say, because uh, we can use file suffixes to, you know, in order to try to distinguish between the two or some uh, machine learning method, but that's going to be difficult. Uh, we want to have a much simpler solution that would allow us to differentiate between the two. So there's no good threshold for saying, okay, above this entropy, it's encrypted. Below this entropy, this is just compressed. What we can do, though, is that we can compare files to themselves. 
So we're not talking about some absolute threshold. We're just comparing a file, a file to itself. And um, as I said, good encryption is high entropy and ransomware wants good encryption. If, there's not, if the ransomware is not doing good encryption, then maybe it's hard to detect, but it's going to be also possible to decrypt. So it wants good encryption. Um, and when we talk about per file entropy, we might get an indication which is kind of better. So I encrypted uh, all the files that we've seen before, and this is the difference in the calculated entropy of each and every file. So we see in the, in the log file, of course, there was a, a huge change. In the compressed file, the change is really minor. Um, for some of them, it's not that minor. For other, it's really harder to detect. But the thing is that we are looking at all the files in a specific directory. So we can say that, well, if you're going to see some high rate of possibly encrypted file or high proportion of possibly encrypted file in that directory, this could give us another indication that uh, there is ransomware or encryption going on. So this was really a background for, for the, uh, uh, the information theory background. Uh, now, let's focus on what we have with Ceph. So Ceph is a free and open source storage system. It's free to use. It's free from vendor lock-ins. It's software-defined uh, storage, so software-only solution. Um, it's open source and free to change. You can look at the code, change it, some bugs, and so on. I advise you to do that. Um, it's also open-ended, so the, it has many integration points, and we'll look at that a little deeper further on. Um, Ceph um, is a unified storage system. It has a block interface, a file interface, and what I'm going to focus here is the object interface that it's going to have. Uh, so it's uh, S3 compliant, um, and the, uh, the front-end interface, it's called the Redis Gateway. This is would give us this, um, uh, this object layout. At the back, we have something called LibRadius, and this is the library uh, that gives us access to the back end, to what actually does the storage. And Radius, this is the core of the system that, that actually puts the information into disks, uh, replicates them, and does everything that is needed to have a highly available, highly scalable uh, storage solution. Um, I mentioned open-ended before, and uh, what I meant here is that we have all kinds of means in the system that allows you to customize it and tune it into and, and um, integrate with external systems without the necessity to write C++ code, compile the system, build the system from, uh, by yourself. So we have C++ and, and Lua object classes that you can run inside the, um, uh, the core on the on the disk themselves um, we have bug identification in the object uh, front end you can get notification for external system and trigger lambda functions or other serverless solutions uh, to do extra processing if needed uh, we can interact with cloud storage and in the context of this talk i'm going to focus on uh, lua scripting lua scripting is the ability to look into the object as are they're being uploaded into the uh, um, Redis uh, gateway and manipulate them, uh, read their content, uh, look at their metadata, and so on. So deploying all that could be complex, but here we have an excellent tool that comes to help. It's called Rook. It's, uh, it's our orchestrator uh, for um, uh, Kubernetes and OpenShift environment. Uh, it's an operator that makes deployment really easy, as I say, easy as YAML, uh, for almost everything. So the Lua feature is really new. It's not integrated into Rook yet, so we'll have to do that manually. But the rest of the things are really easy. So after you install Rook, if you want to run um, a Ceph cluster with uh, an object front end, we just need two YAMLs, and they're described here. You configure the YAML, push them, and everything is happening automatically, and you have the... Uh, the backend storage and the the, the front uh, the uh, object storage uh, front end and everything is working beautifully. So Lua scripting. First of all, why did we choose Lua? Uh, so Lua is a mature and powerful language. It's easy to learn. It's lightweight. Its integration with C or C++ is super efficient, and we can achieve that with zero copy. It's really flexible, so you can change stuff. You just upload a new script. Don't need to compile anything. You don't need to, need to build a new Ceph or anything. And uh, you can change the behavior and quite easily. And in, in the world of security, the, everything like ransomware is really a moving target. It's, 
it's going to change itself and uh, the ability to change the solution or tailor the solution without the need to rebuild Ceph is uh, extremely useful in those cases. Here's an example of how we do uh, write the Lua script. Um, we have the request context that gives us all the information about the, up, the request that came into the Redis gateway uh, into the, the, the object front end. Uh, you can have all kind of information and you can also change information. Yeah, you can put new metadata, change uh, bucket names, do whatever. And uh, um, we also, so here, this is in, really in the context of a single request. Uh, as you, you would see um, for our solution, you also need something which is more global. So we have an RGW, a Redis Gateway global table that each and every request context can access and read and write from. Uh, so, so th this is the, the what we have in the in the Lua scripting, and later on I'm going to show how this really uh, works together for the solution. So, how can you harness the characteristics or the attributes of an object storage and our Lua abilities in order to um, address the uh, the ransomware problem? So, this is really a high level description of what the script is doing. Well, when uh, an object is being uploaded, the first thing we need to check if and this is in the global table that I mentioned before, is if this bucket is marked as infected. Well, if it's infected, we're going to quarantine the request, which means we're going to change the bucket name, and the new object is going to be written to a special quarantine bucket. Uh, this is important so we don't override. So if this is really ransomware infected, we don't override the original object, which, which would allow later on to um, restore our data. But if we kind of have a false positive, it's, it, it's not really infected. We also going to have the data in a new bucket, so we don't, we don't lose the data. But let's say that the bucket is not marked as infected yet. So what we do, we're going to calculate the entropy for the current object. Well, objects could be huge. An object could be a, a couple of gigabytes uh, uh, movie clip. It could be uh, a virtual machine image. But we don't actually need to um, calculate the entropy from the entire object. We're going to just do that for the first chunk. Also, because the, uh, the S3 um, object API really allows us to upload objects in chunks, so we, we don't really see the entire object. But that should be uh, sufficient in most cases, and there's uh, some research around that showing that this is true. Um, now, if this is a new object, so the first time we saw the object, so the object doesn't really have an existing entropy, then, well, we just store it. If it's infected, tough luck. If it's not infected, it's just going to store that. If the object have, is already in, a, in the bucket, which means that we already calculated the entropy for the object sometime in the past, then we're going to compare the new and the old entropies and compare them to a threshold. Again, it's not an absolute threshold. It's just to see the difference. And as I've seen before, even for compressed objects, you do see a difference in some of the cases uh, in the entropy of the encrypted object. If you encrypt a, a compressed object, you would still see some difference in, in, in many cases. Now, if this is above the threshold, then it could be an infected object. So we have to update some of something around the bucket, the bucket like directory. Um, saying, OK, what is the infection rate or what is the infected percentage uh, of objects in this bucket? And um, then we need to calculate and see, and this is global. This is um, in the global table. And then we have to calculate to see, well, is, is this kind of global indicator um, gives us uh, information that the bucket is infected or we have an infected system? If it has, we mark the bucket as infected. If not, then maybe you know we had one or two encrypted objects, but overall we see lots of objects that are not encrypted, so we just store the object correctly. So um, this really is a, a high-level description of the script. Uh, of course, in this is probably wrong in many cases, and also there's probably no one size fits all. Uh, but the beauty of of a, a Lua script-based solution is that it's very easy to change. And each deployment uh, could tune its its algorithm and change it and so on, um, so it would fit better to the uh, um, uh, ransomware or the problems that it is facing. A couple of resources here if you want to read more. Uh, there are a couple of research papers talking about um, um, use of entropy to detect ransomware. 
Uh, there's a great uh, SNIA talk about using behavioral uh, analysis um, to detect ransomware. There's lots of information about um, how to use Ceph, how to use um, Rook, and how to uh, use Lua in the object of Ceph. So I really appreciate your time and thank you so much for attending this session. Um, please get in touch with me if you want to know more about this subject. Um, so thank you and goodbye.